For those interested in purchasing a brand new iMac for 2020, but just aren't sure which configuration to get, sit tight my friend because this is the video for you welcome back guys and for those that are new here i want to give you a warm welcome onto my channel today we're going to put our speed testing pants on and really put these two machines to the test ladies and gentlemen what we have here is a baseline imac straight how it comes this is the 1800 dollars variant with the following specs on screen right now kind of crazy that the entry 16 inch macbook pro costs more than this fully fledged all-in-one desktop but slow down hold your horses the configuration options for the iMac can quickly start to get very expensive luckily for you guys I have both extremes of the spectrum here I have for you guys the baseline that I mentioned earlier and also a fully spec 2020 iMac complete with the nano etched glass which I mean doesn't have that big of a difference in performance but anyway that coveted 10 core 10th gen i9 chip maxed out to 128 gigabytes of ram and the best graphics option available that being the radeon pro 5700 xt whether you are confused or just flat out unsure of which model to get the aim of this video is to capture performance from one end being the baseline all the way to the top tier option that way you can gauge at how well your configuration will match up you already know how we do it on this channel we test everything including single core tests gaming tests exporting tests and so much more so without further ado let's roll into this intro and get this party started let's go let me first preface by saying that whenever i got my first imac i was ecstatic Truthfully, iMacs are one of the best solutions for your all-in-one desktop needs. It's just so intuitive, it's the complete package. Sure, the age design is something Apple lovers have complained about over the years, especially me. I think it's time we finally saw a redesign to breathe life into the beloved desktop line. And as many of you know, when purchasing an iMac from the Apple online store, you have the option of upgrading certain internal components like your RAM and storage. How much is right for you and which configuration would best suit your needs is totally reliant up to you and your workload. I really hope to answer those questions, but if you're still stuck by the end of this video, which is highly probable, trust me, the buying process on any Mac can be very stressful. Because, I mean, come on, man, this is a huge investment for a ton of people. When you're talking of paying $2,000, $3,000, even upwards of $8,000, thousand dollars on an iMac yeah you can begin to see why it's so important to do your homework so that you don't buy a machine that's either going to be overkill for your workload or not be enough so anyway one more time here are the specs of each machine combined side by side here for you to compare in particular a lot of people want to know what kind of gains that 10 core chip brings whether there are any thermal issues and how well the best graphics option performs so without wasting any more time let's begin with some tests and as always, I feel it's always mandatory to start out with good old Geekbench just because it is one of the most popular and quick tests that give a rough idea at the capabilities of your hardware. I theorize the multi-core being drastically different and yup, look at that. The single scores are actually a bit higher on the baseline, kind of surprising. I ran the test about three times and every single time the base scored a higher score on single core, but really, all three times they were within the margin of error and doesn't prove much. Either way, multi-core is a better indication at a stronger machine since those applications are continuously being updated and it's always nice to have those extra cores to help out with multi-threaded tasks or applications. As you can see, our fully spec almost reaching scores of 10 thousand while our baseline model is practically half that with a score of 5480 on the multi-core side. In regards to OpenCL and Geekbench's own metal graphics test, we see huge disparities in our two machines. For OpenCL, the baseline model scored 36,097, while the iMac on steroids, I mean, the fully specced one flexes its guns with a nice 
51,971. And same story for the metal test. The baseline with a score of about 38,000 with the superior fully spec version scoring 57,956. Insane. That's crazy gaming potential. We'll definitely have to go over gaming, but not yet. For now, we head over to Cinebench R20. Cinebench is that test that allows me to see if a machine is struggling to render out this image, and while neither of these really struggled per se, I did notice the fully specced fans cranking into high gear early on. This is important to know as us tech nerds know about thermal throttling all too well. But with a chassis this big, it really shouldn't be too big of a concern, but either way, Way, we'll still look at thermals a little bit later in this video. For now, we can see the baseline model scores 3194, while the fully spec outperformed expectations and comes in with 5250. Pretty impressive gains when comparing each other, honestly. And now Unigen Heaven and Valley. These two applications are really good at mimicking gaming potential, with each test having a variety of scenes with different textures and intensity of detail. For Heaven, we can again see massive improvements in the graphics department thanks to that super powerful Radeon Pro 5700 XT just bullying the Radeon Pro 5300 and making it look like Jose Aldo versus Conor McGregor. I mean, look at these max frame rates. The base couldn't do any better than 82 FPS at its best, while the fully spec says hold my nano edge glass and strikes back with a max frame rate of 140 FPS. Pretty impressive. And same story over on Valley. The fully spec completely decimating the baseline model. On average, the fully spec model is pumping out 30 extra frames per second over the baseline model according to our testing. So gamers, I know Macs aren't always the go-to for gaming, but these results aren't bad for anyone interested in purchasing a Mac for occasional graphically intensive gaming sessions. I would 10 out of 10 recommend the best graphic card option available if looking into gaming or other tasks that require a good bit of graphical horsepower like 3D rendering and video editing to an extent. And while on the topic of gaming, I went ahead and ran and played two games to see what all the hype is about on these two different iMacs. For one, and this is just a personal nitpick, those bezels, man. I know some of you guys like them, but coming from a Pro Display XDR with tiny bezels, this thing just seems ancient and archaic. But here's Fortnite and some Call of Duty Modern Warfare. I know it's an old game and everything like that, but whatever. I like Modern Warfare and it's just such a good game. But anyway, yeah, to no one's surprise, the fully spec iMac outperformed the base model by pretty good margins. So both played pretty well. I didn't see any major hiccups, but the fully spec iMac definitely ran much smoother. Almost felt like butter if you want me to be honest. However, on average, the fully spec consistently achieved better frame rates over the base model, averaging about 88 FPS, give or take, while the base consistently hovered above 62 FPS. This isn't too bad as I think a good benchmark is that 60 FPS threshold. But of course, that's only one game, so we also tested Fortnite, which by the way is throwing hella shade at Apple currently. Basically, for those who don't know, Apple blocked the creators of Fortnite from releasing their new season, and they're in this huge legal battle, and it's just... <sighs> I don't know man, it's just crazy, but even then on Fortnite, once again, both do a great job with the base averaging about 80 FPS on land scenes and 70 FPS in water scenes, while the fully spec got about 110 FPS on land and averaged 100 FPS around water or intensively graphic scenes. I mean, a 30 FPS bump isn't bad at all. 110 FPS is actually pretty decent, so it goes a long way to say that Apple definitely has improved their gaming potential and hopefully one day can make up for lost ground in terms of the gaming scene. Up next, I really didn't think that the storage would be this big of a difference, but man was I shocked. So now in 2020 across the board, all iMacs have an SSD storage and no longer have a fusion drive or a physical hard drive, which is a blessing. It's about time. But the baseline model only has 256 gigabytes of SSD, which in my opinion isn't near enough for anyone taking their profession seriously. This fully spec model does have 8 terabytes of storage. So at the beginning, I thought that there wouldn't be that big of a difference in terms of read and write speeds, but boy was I wrong. So on the base model, we scored about 920 on average on write speeds and about 1350 on read. To my surprise, the fully spec model on write speed scored about 3000 megs per second consistently and the read speed was about 2600. 
So it really does seem by this test, one can easily conclude that the higher tiered storage options are going to perform much better over the baseline 256 or even the half a terabyte storage option. Whichever one you do get, iMacs and MacBooks have always been known for having very speedy SSDs, so you really shouldn't notice too big of a difference in real world performance. But proceeding right along, the metal benchmark test kind of goes hand in hand with gaming, tapping into those graphical potentials and again across the board we see the fully spec model completely demolishing the base model as you can see from these charts. Most impressively look at the huge difference in the T-Rex test. Yes this is a very basic test but 944 FPS compared to 1463? my dude these are massive gains it's like the fully spec model overloaded on roids brock lesnar style man geez even over on the blender test a test known to conglomerate everything a machine is capable of the fully spec model surprised the heck out of me finishing the test in just 12 minutes and 19 seconds this was a total surprise as other machines like the macbook air take two whole hours however the baseline model didn't score all too bad because it can in not too far behind at just about 20 minutes. The only other machine that can finish this test in record time is my Mac Pro, so seeing 12 minutes on the Blender test is really good, trust me. It shows a lot about how well a system can perform. And finally, let's go over the test that my fellow video creators and photographers truly care about. So here we start with Final Cut Pro and export the same 5 minute video with multiple edits including LUTs, effects, transitions, and several animations. Well here are the results. The fully spec did do much better exporting the clip in 4 minutes and 21 seconds while the base model did it in 6 minutes and 27 seconds. This aspect of a computer is crucial for video creators who are always on the move and where time is literal money. So to my peeps doing a lot of video editing, invest in more RAM, a better processor and of course the graphics option. This was only a 5 minute clip with a decent amount of edits but imagine those who edit 30 minute clips or even full length movies. This is where the difference could be much greater so choose your configuration wisely. And last but not least here is a photo export test using Adobe Lightroom. I exported a ton since I recently did a few photo shoots. I think it was well above a thousand photos. I applied the same settings on all photos and on both machines and exported the exact same photos to make everything consistent. This was a shocker to me since the fully spec outperformed the base model by huge margins. The base model did the best it could and finished it in 13 minutes and 27 seconds. Not too impressive. Oh man way better results here as the fully spec exported all thousand plus photos in just three minutes and 50 seconds and before i round out this video i know some of you guys are interested to see how well thermals are on the 10 core processor and i don't blame you 10 cores is insane potential for power so long as the thermals are under control but rest assured, the chassis here is way too big to create any huge problems. I'm not going to lie, the 10 core chipset does run hotter and the fans do crank up here and there, even when you least expect them. I'm telling you, during the Cinebench test for example, this fully spec model was pretty audible with those fans. So if you have like a quiet office environment and working with heavy tasks, just know these fans can get pretty loud. But anyways, here's the progression. I like to keep things consistent so I restarted each system and left them on idle for about 10 minutes to begin so you can see the starting temperatures. Notice the 10 core chipset is already running about 5 or 4 degrees hotter but let's continue. We open up 2 chrome tabs then we up the ante to 10 chrome tabs still pretty well under control but the 10 core is still noticeably hotter. Then we open up Adobe Photoshop and Apple TV and still pretty good progress so far nothing out of the ordinary then we open up the one and only's latest video in a separate safari tab followed by apple maps plus a two minute video export and still well under control but both machines now cranking up into higher gear having those internal temperatures slowly climb up the final thing i did was to run a cinebench test with everything else i mentioned running in the background and this is where we begin to see the 10 core reaching near peak temperatures almost reaching 100 degrees celsius with the base model staying a cool 10 degrees behind pun intended so long story short it takes a lot for either of these machines to begin to get hot however the 10 core does run noticeably higher and what i want you to take away from these thermals is that if fan noise is any concern for you the 10 core will be more 
more audible in most instances, but I think the trade-off in performance is definitely worth it. So guys, there it is. We have some decent benchmarks for the 2020 iMac lineup. We have two opposite ends of the spectrum, one being the base model and the other being the fully spec model. A difference of about seven grand separates the two. Of course, the nano texture serves little purpose in the way of actual internal performance, but it does go to show how much you can possibly spend for your home desktop setup. That's the reason for these kinds of videos, so you guys can be as informed as possible. The base costs $1,800 here in the US of A, while the fully spec costs you way over $8,000 and that's before tax. The choice is yours, but as always, Please feel free to DM me with your configuration options and scenarios so that I can make the best recommendation for you that I can. My DMs do get flooded, so please be patient, but here are my social media handles so you guys can reach me. It'd be an honor to help you guys out, and while you're at it, might as well give me a follow. But guys, this video is long enough as it is. I really hope this video gave you guys some insight and helped you out. If it did, please give this video a like as it helps my channel out tremendously. That way my videos reach and help out other people. There's so much Apple's releasing in the next coming months, including potentially new iPads, AirTags, new iPhones, new Apple Watches, and of course, those lovely, sexy new bands. Either way, I'm so excited to unbox and review everything, so make sure you subscribe to my channel with bell notifications so that you don't miss out on any of the action, but I think that's been it from me, guys. I hope you guys are staying safe out there, and I cannot wait to catch you all in my next video. Peace out.